Hi, welcome to the signal path. In this episode, we're going to take a look at one of these X-ray dosimeter tags. You're supposed to attach this somewhere in your body, typically around your neck, whenever you're using X-ray imaging equipment. And the purpose here is that it will measure how much X-ray you may have been exposed to during a certain amount of time that you're operating near that machine. And you can imagine how important this is. If there is some leak in the X-ray equipment or there is some excessive amount of X-ray, this will tell you that you're being exposed to it. Now, this one was rated for about six months. It's now essentially expired. You're supposed to send this in for analysis. This. Now, during this time, I didn't really do much x-ray, so therefore there was no point sending it in because it was just going to simply come back negative anyway. Now, even though this seems like a really simple device, there is a lot of really interesting science behind how it works. It's actually quite complicated in its fundamental theory of operation, and it has a lot of interesting things inside of it. So I thought we'll take a close look at it and analyze it. And this one had some barcodes that I removed, and you can see this is obviously from my work at Bell Labs. So let's dive into the science because it's pretty cool. Now, on the other side, you can see that there's some barcode over there, and then there is another, a window over here, some interesting features, and then, yeah, the rest of it doesn't seem like much, but there's a lot in there. So let's think about what kind of properties and features a tag like this should have for it to be useful in this kind of application. Well, it has to mimic the human body in some ways and measure the impact of the actual radiation on our body. Now, it turns out that for human bodies and biological matter in general, radiation has an accumulative effect. So if you've been exposed to one minute of radiation today and one minute of radiation next week, that's actually two minutes in total. And it doesn't matter that there is a week in between. And all of the damage done to your DNA, to your cell structure, is essentially a statistical average that's going to get worse and worse with more exposure you have. So you have to have some kind of memory which is quite tricky because there's no electronics in here. So whatever we are using in there has to capture that total accumulated effect. And the second thing is that it has to have some kind of a discrimination against different photon energies. And that's because different X-ray energies will dissipate in different parts of your body. So low X-ray energy dissipates in your skin just a few millimeters. And that poses some danger to that type of cell. As you increase the X-ray energy, it will penetrate deeper and deeper into the body, affecting your internal organs. And that's a different kind of problem. And there are regulations and biological studies that have been done to measure what that impact is. So this also has to separate, to some extent at least, the difference in the photon energy between those things. So you can measure where it is being dissipated in your body. So we need that too, at the same time as having memory. That's getting more and more complicated. Let's also briefly remind ourselves of the X-ray generation process from an X-ray tube in general. Now, I have taken this apart in one of the previous videos and talked about exactly how it works, but the fundamental principle is not that complicated. So we do have a heater in here, which is going to create thermionic emissions of electrons, and we put a very strong electric field across it with a very high voltage, and that's going to accelerate those electrons, and they're going to hit this metal, typically tungsten or some alloy of that. And there's a 45 degree angle there. And then the striking of those high energy electrons onto that surface is going to generate X-ray through the brehm strolong effect. And on this side, there's a brilliant window and the X-ray is going to come out of this. Now it's important to note that the higher the potential we put across here, the stronger the electric field, we're going to get higher energy photons coming out. So if you put, let's say 50 kilovolt across it, we will get a broad spectrum of X-ray emissions going all the way up to 50K electron volts of photon energy coming out. That means that if I make a specific voltage, I'm still going to get every energy of the photon statistically distributed up to that energy level that I put in. So X-ray sources are not in these sharp peaks of energy. They're going to be really broadband. That's, in fact, one way you can differentiate gamma energy from X-ray because they're really essentially identical. It's just that sources of X-ray like this are going to be fairly broadband. So it means that from a source like this, we still want to know what are the different ranges of energy coming out. That's going to tell you something about the source of the X-ray. Okay, so now we know all of this, and we want to find out how this thing works. Well, the first thing we should do is X-ray the X-ray tag to see what it looks like through it. And here's our tag directly in the X-ray machine. Now, this particular machine doesn't actually go very high in photon energy or X-ray energy. The maximum I can do is 35 kilovolt. I'm going to expose for 19 seconds, so that's the, also the maximum amount of time I can do it. And let's see what kind of image we get out of this. And here's the X-ray of the X-ray tag. The outer plastic casing is clearly visible, and there's some really interesting features we can immediately observe. First of all, it's got these periodic holes on it that looks like it could be fed into some kind of a reader, and it can engage with a mechanism that can feed it through linearly, let's say, through something. There's a clip in here, so something inside of it can certainly be removed. Now, if you look over here, that's really where the magic happens. We see a little circle here, and then we see some maybe crystal structure there in the center. Then we see another one, and then we see two white squares. Now, remember that for X-ray, black areas means nothing's blocking the X-ray. White essentially means that the X-ray has not penetrated. 
So here we do see a metallic disc, and we actually could see that through the tag as well. So whatever material is in here is repeated multiple times. Now, if you look very, very carefully, there is a very faint outline of something similar to this appearing behind this white score as well. And then nothing over here is completely opaque, essentially, to x-ray. Nothing is going through. Now, this is done at around 25 kilovolt and 6 seconds of exposure. What I can do in my machine is that I can set it to 35 kilovolt and 19 seconds of exposure. And then if I do that, I get this image. This basically means that everything is saturated, so the sensor basically is completely flooded. But there are still features of it that are recognizable. So there is a metallic outer disk that's still visible. This one is completely gone. Now you can see the other one, the replica, much more clearly, and this is still completely blocked. So by now, it should, hopefully, it should be pretty clear what they are trying to do. It looks like that they are filtering X-ray at different amounts, and that allows you to differentiate the energy of the X-ray depending on whatever they are using here to block the actual material that's the detector. So this thing must be the detecting material in there, and then this metallic disc around it. So this could be, for example, maybe a reference. This could be partially blocked by just the plastic. This is with some other filter that's blocking even more. And then finally, this one is blocking even more. So based on this, and based on the fact that my X-ray machine cannot go over 35 kilovolt, whatever this is that's blocking this last detector is intended for even higher energies of X-ray. If I could put this into, let's say, 160 kilovolt uh, X-ray machine, you'd probably be able to see through this one as well. So this already tells us so much. So now there's a couple of open questions still. First of all, what are these filters made of? I'm sure you can guess. And then, what is this material actually made of too? So how can this eventually be read, and how does it accumulate the effect of X-ray over time? So now we should really go ahead and take this thing apart and see what's underneath all of this. So now with that information, let's take this further apart and see what's inside it. I can peel this off, and I am sure that you kind of have guessed what's underneath this already. If I can get this off and check it out, just as we thought, there are metallic filters. Now these filters are going to filter various parts of the X-ray spectrum. And if I remove the sticker from the other side, well, we'll find exactly the same thing. And that makes sense because you need to filter the X-ray from both sides of the detector. There is no front or back to these kind of tags. You can be hanging it off your body and X-ray can go right through you anyway. And therefore, you need to have this filter on either side. And then if you look at it a little bit carefully, we can see that there are one, two, three, four regions. In fact, I can take this further apart and pull the detector out that aligns with each of these sections. And unclipping the detector section allows us to pull it out directly. And we can see that it has individual sections. I'll talk about the detectors in a second. And then we can align it back to this so we can appreciate what's going on. There it is. So there are four different regions. You can see one of them lines up with this. I believe this is the reference. That's where all the measurements are going to be compared with the total amount of X-ray coming in across all energies. And then we have some plastic that's covering the first detector. Then we have aluminum, and then we have copper. And this is the progression of higher and higher energy required from the X-ray photons to penetrate these barriers. And this really is interesting because it scales with the atomic number of the material. Now, copper is a much more dense material with a higher atomic number, bigger atoms, a lot more electrons. And that allows the photoelectric effect from the X-ray absorption to happen at even higher energy levels of the X-ray. So statistically, copper is going to block higher energy X-rays much better than aluminum, and both of them much better than plastic, of course. And this is exactly how they scale and create these kind of quote-unquote low-pass filters, allowing to find out how much of each energy is coming in in the dosimeter. Now, if they wanted to find out even higher energies of X-ray and differentiate between them as well, they could use materials like gold, lead, tungsten, anything with a higher atomic number. In fact, the absorption energy required goes to the power of three to four of the atomic number. So it grows really rapidly, and more dense materials with higher atomic numbers can easily block high energy X-ray. This is very similar, of course, to gamma spectroscopy as well. Gamma radiation is also blocked by heavier uh, molecules of atoms of various types. That's why, for example, lead shielding is so effective. So now that we have an idea of how they filter that, the question becomes, what does the detector look like? How does that work? Now, these detectors are probably my favorite part of this tag. These are called TLDs, thermoluminescent dosimeters. And thermoluminescent in this situation refers to the mechanism by which they are read to find out how much X-ray they have been subject to. And we'll get to that in a second. But the structure itself is very interesting. The color and the crystalline form of it leads me to think that these are lithium, fluoride, magnesium, titanium kind of detectors. And that's a mouthful of elements. But each of them play a pretty important role. So lithium fluoride itself is a white crystalline structure, which is what we are seeing over there. And when we looked at the X-ray, you could kind of see that it had that crystalline structure to it. 
Now, what happens is that you're doping this crystal structure with magnesium and titanium. And whenever you dope a crystal with these kind of impurities, they knock off the lattice and they display some of the atoms inside of the crystal. They become kind of like defects. Now, when X-ray hits lithium fluoride, you get fluorescent. And that fluorescent happens during the X-ray exposure. Now, that itself isn't very useful because you're not reading the tag during the X-ray. So even if it fluoresces, you can't detect it anyway. You want to somehow store that. And that's where magnesium comes in. When X-ray hits these crystal structures of lithium fluoride, sometimes some of the electrons go into higher energy bands. And occasionally, they get trapped because of the magnesium defects in the crystalline structure. So now you have these electrons that at room temperature are trapped inside of the structure. And that's the key. That's the memory effect. The more X-ray that hits it, the more of these electrons get trapped into the lattice of the crystal. Now, all these electrons are just sitting there waiting at room temperature, and they cannot get out. And that's where thermoluminescence comes from. If you heat this sample up to about 400 degrees Celsius or so, those trapped electrons escape, and they hit the titanium, and that moves its energy bands higher. And during the return, they emit photons, and those photons are UV photons. So there's a lot going on. I mean, it's, the science is just absolutely amazing. So you get the crystal, you hit it with the X-ray, electrons move up, get trapped in the magnesium lattice, come back down. When they come back at 400 degrees Celsius, hit the titanium, you get fluorescent, UV comes out, and now you want to read the UV. Now you can imagine that the amount of UV coming out is very, very small, but the amount of UV photons escaping it during the thermoluminescence period is directly proportional to the amount of X-ray distinct experience during the time that you were wearing it. And that's the dosimeter part. So with this really clever combination of atoms and crystal structures and materials and the science behind it, you can actually read this by heating it up. Now that sounds a little bit easier than it actually is because when you heat this up to about 400 degrees Celsius, you're trying to capture a few photons here and there. So you need a photomultiplier tube that's sensitive to UV and that becomes tricky because then you have to have a hot sample near something else. Now, if there is enough interest, I might actually try to build something like that so that we can read one of these tags. So therefore, during the actual reading process, they read each of these individually. And by measuring the exact curve of the UV light coming out, they figure out how much X-ray in each band could have been possibly present. And they tell you that whether you were exposed to too much radiation or not, and what the energy of the radiation itself was. And this is a pretty important thing, of course, for human safety. Now, you can also ask, well, how much X-ray can I absorb? It's true that eventually, if you put this thing through so much X-ray, it's going to get saturated and it gets into some weird nonlinear effects where it cannot have any more trapped electrons. But by then, you're way, way over the amount of X-ray you were allowed to be exposed to anyway. So for any normal uses, this is sufficient. Now, there are other kind of TLDs, actually, with other you know, structures and other physical properties. But I think that the one I described is the one we're looking at simply by the color and how common it is. Very cool science. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this quick look at these X-ray safety tags. One of the great joys in life is discovering the complexity of deceptively simple looking things. And this is definitely one of those. There are many of these in use, and it's just amazing to see how much human ingenuity and complexity there is in their operation. Let me know in the comment section also if you want me to try and build that thermoluminescent detector, which is going to be an interesting experiment itself using UV photomultiplier tubes. And as always, I'll see you next time.